and we've known each other for 25 years. And this is a monumental moment. How are you, my friend? <laughs> I'm doing great. I love that T-shirt. Where did you get that T-shirt from? You, you know what? I When I met you coming out of the Molson Amphitheater, probably like 10 years ago, I actually had this T-shirt. One of my buddies in Tampa bought it. And um, I'm still waiting to get whipped, but um, we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> That's so cool. Anyway, it's, lo it's lovely to see you. And um, <clears throat> I'm glad we're having a chance to Zoom for the first time together. It's amazing, isn't it? It's, it's absolutely amazing. There's some terrible stuff going around the world, but um, we're making the best of it. That's what we have to do. And, um, you know, I reflect about what we're all dealing with around around the world. And it's it's very much like what we've always done in the metal community with our music, which is, you know, we've we've reached out as we are reaching out, supporting each other through this pandemic with our music, with our texts, with our emails, with our Zooms. So um, it's tough. It's very tough, especially for those of us that have been really hit hard. But um, yeah, stay strong, stay metal, and we'll get through it. I have to say, because we've, we've spoke a million times, um, but I've never been spoken to like you spoke to me with this book. It was so beautifully written. It was so wonderful and so heartfelt. Um, yeah, a lot of struggles, obviously, but there was a beautiful ending. But just the way you wrote it, it, it really put tears in my eyes. I'm like, wow, this is a side of the metal god that none of, none of us have seen. Yeah, and um, that was one of the things that I kept questioning and pushing back from as far back as like the 30, my late 30s, early 40s, when publishers were, were approaching me. And I would always say, you know, I don't really know if I want to do this kind of book. I, I don't, I don't know if, if I'm ready yet, you know? And um, I also said that I felt that, you know, I, I had more of a life to live as a person, <clears throat> as, as well as in, in my life in metal. And so, you know, you change, you're changing life. You're a different person as a teenager. You're a different person in your thirties, your forties. And now as I, inch towards the big 7-0, um, I'm, I'm a different person again. I'm very content, I'm very um, relaxed. I, I'm, I'm blessed with this beautiful life. And I just thought, you know, let's just have a go. Let's have a go, let's see what we can do. And uh, let's just share it uh, for those that are interested in checking out these other parts of my life that I've kept to myself until now. But truly the weight of the world when this book was released just got lifted off your shoulders like and you said it you're pushing 70 so you've been carrying this weight for that many years and wow like it's like it, I, I can't imagine the stress and the frustration and the most wonderful thing about the book as well is like we're like the way you, it's written like we're walking in your shoes but the weight of the world wow how does it feel to be so liked? <laughs> <laughs> I'll never feel truly liked, Tim, because I'm the metal god. <laughs> I'm made of metal. <laughs> um, but I know what you're saying. And yeah, here's the thing. I'm not unique with, with some of these stories. Uh, so many of us have dealt with either sexual identity issues or, you know, mental health issues or abuse or suicide, you know, drugs, alcohol. But I think by sharing these experiences, it just opens up um, more discussion. It opens up uh, a part of me that I, I always feel I wanna get as close as, as I possibly can to my fans as possible. And this is just another way of doing that. And definitely the, the cathartic value of just laying it all out is, is very useful. It is very useful mentally. Is the, if you have a if you have any kind of problem, the best thing you can do is is to either find a friend or, or anyone to share it with, you know, to share all all these all these things that you're going through. It, it's bad to keep it to yourself. It's bad to keep it hidden. 
it's bad to try and push it away because it never vanishes. And even by revealing it, it, it doesn't totally dissipate, but it definitely does, as you've, as you've just said, it takes something of a weight off, the, off your shoulders. It was quite interesting to, to read about the pain that you were feeling with the potential that if you would have come out, this mm. band that was a, mm. virtually exploding around the planet would have mm. imploded. But I have to ask you, when the Elton John interviews started with like that Rolling Stone interview where he actually came out and yes. it like, I don't know if it, it didn't destroy his career, but it, because yes. nobody was on the same page, that must yes. have been like hell for you. Well, I, I, obviously I was aware of that moment for Elton and, and internally I'm thinking, thank God for you, you know, uh, and, and um, we know Tim. We know we know our, our metal world now is is so inclusive. We still have some issues of phobias of this, that, and the other, but it's a much different place to where where we were all at in the seventies when pre started, and then through most of the eighties. It was very difficult for people like me to be truly open in our world and. You know, hindsight, reflection, it's always, it always has value. As you know, when I did step forward and proclaim who I was in, in that part of my, my being, um, nothing but great things came from it. So as a result of that, you know, I'm like, why didn't I do this before? You know, why didn't I take this step before? But you can't rush something like this. You can't, it, it happens when it happens for, for all the right reasons. So what happened in 1998, and I'm, I'm actually really curious with this MTV thing, who did you speak to right after that big interview, that big, like, who was like, what was the first call or the first person that you, was it your mom, your dad, was it your manager? Oh, that's a, that's a really cool question. I don't think I've been asked this question, Tim. I, re, I know I went back to the hotel I think I was with one person that took me to the MTV studios. And then I went back to the hotel and um, had a cup of tea and a slice of cheesecake. Because <laughs> what else are you gonna do? Kind of celebrated. <laughs> and um, I do remember, I mean, this is before, was the internet there in 1998? <laughs> I'm sure it was, wasn't it? Well, did we have emails then? <laughs> all, all I know is that my family, they were so pleased and happy for me. And that was, that was the best of, of all of the feedback that was coming back to me. That was the most um, reassuring and made me feel even better that my family knew all the time, of course, but for them to, um, I dare say, um, uh, feel relief for me as much as anything else, they would just said, look, we're, we're so pleased for you. We're so happy. And, and that was just great. But there still are issues. Can we talk about gay intolerance? What, what actually still bothers you about like, non-acceptance? That's probably the best way to put it. I just don't understand it. I think it's just a human quirk. It's just very strange to me. I just can't figure it out. A lot of it is, is, um, is like uh, acting it out from people around you or from your family unit. It's the same as racism, you know, and xenophobia and, and, and all of these things where people go on the attack. I've never understood it. Um, I mean, I'm all for difference of opinions. We're all entitled to a different opinion and a different this, that and the other. But to actually physically attack another person as well as mentally attack another person with like online abuse or whatever. It's just beyond me. I can't, I can't figure it out. I've always said again, that I think that, that certain people are also in their own dilemma that they can't figure their own identity, whatever it might be. Um, so it, it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very unusual it's a very unusual thing. I mean, if, if there was a cure, it would have been cured, wouldn't it? But there isn't. And it, it's still here. It's 2020. 
you know, and, and particularly down here in America, we've got all this divisiveness going on for lots of different reasons. And it's just a shame. It's a real shame more than anything else. It makes me feel sad, but it also makes me feel angry. And, and, and uh, the best way to um, channel your anger is to speak out and, and, to, and to push back at, at people that attack people like myself. And um, I've said a million times, I'm not an activist. I don't have the qualifications, but if you attack one of my people, I'm going to stand up for you like we stand up for each other in the metal community. If you attack our metal, we'll, we'll stand up for what we believe in. So um, it's a shame. It's a shame. And, you know, you never give up. You never give in like Glenn. And you keep pushing back and you try and find some kind of solution if there ever will be. We've never, we've never spoke of a religion and I'm not trying to bring it up like that, but it was, it's interesting that the Pope actually keeps kind of inching and this week he actually brought up the whole same sex marriage thing. So it's any feelings about, I know it's, it's kind of ridiculous that it's like, oh, it's not, why are you bring it up now? It's not ridiculous, Tim. I'm so glad you did bring it up because when I read about that, it kind of confirmed my feelings about this man. He has a he talk about the weight on your shoulders. Oh my God, he's got the biggest weight every day, but he, he handles it so eloquently and so beautifully. And for, and there's still it's still swirling today. I mean, you know, we talked before. I'm a bit of a news hound, and I'm very interested in this because of its ramifications. You know, um, the the what what we what I, as I understand it, and, and this is please don't get me wrong here, but in Catholicism, Catholicism, the teachings, the teachings by the the formal teaching about homosexuality is that it's like it's like a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. Yeah, we accept you, but what you do is horrible. Well, that's neither one thing nor the other, you know. Um, so for for Pope Francis to take this incredibly powerful stance and to say that people are entitled to live with each other regardless of who they are. And to share a life and to be given equality is is massive. It's absolutely massive, and this story is constantly developing. Uh, but I've always had a feeling about that guy when he was made pope. I, I felt that internally he was a very good man, and that he wasn't he wasn't sticking to rigid dogma. And and because a lot of these things are outdated, they're so outdated. You know, they go back hundreds and hundreds of years, and we've evolved as people. Our brains have evolved, our thinking has evolved, society's evolved, but but and some 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 of the tenets in in faith are, are based on things from hundreds and thousands of years ago, and that's a beautiful thing. But there are certain there are certain parameters that have shifted, you know. So good for good for Francis, I say. I only said ridiculous because like it's about time. That's that's why I said ridiculous. Yeah. Yes, I know what you're saying, Tim. I know you're, I know you're not being offensive. You, you're, you're being you're being um, cool, and, and you're you're approaching the question um, in, intelligently, like, like we all should debate it. You know, because this is sending shockwaves through um, the world right now, and all forms of religion. I think he's done a, a very powerful thing. Yeah. No, absolutely. <clears throat> Here's a fun question: How many uh, marriage proposals have you had, and have you, <laughs> and have you considered getting married? <laughs> um, Thomas and I have been together for about three thousand years now. <laughs> yes, he's a wonderful man. We've, I've met him a bunch of times. Yeah, yeah, he's the love of my life, and we we talk about it. You know, I mean. What's a bit of paper? Well, it's a lot, actually. It's a lot because of what it gives you. It's because the way laws are structured. And um, and so I think it's inevitable that we will at some point. I don't know when. Um, we, we believe in its value. We believe in its value because why shouldn't we be able to get married like everybody else? It's what we all do. It's the most beautiful union a public union for your guests, for your family, for the world, to see how much you love each other and that you're going to tie the knot. That's great, you know. And um, we, yeah, we, we've talked about it. I think it's inevitable. I, I'm more inclined to, to want to do it than he does. But um, in any kind of relationship, it has to be 50-50. 
you know, once he, once one person gets more sway than the other one, then it gets the balance is like a bit off. So you've really got to agree on something like this, you know, and it's one thing to say, oh, I'm just doing it for my partner. Well, that shouldn't be, you should be doing it for each other, you know, so we'll get there eventually. I, th I think maybe one of his problems is the fact that your last name is God and maybe he doesn't <laughs> want to inherit that as his last name. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. That's funny. No, he calls, he calls me a lot of other. He calls me a lot of other things beside that. Believe you me. <laughs> Can we talk about the fine Judas Priest? Um, yeah. Just, just tying into the whole gay thing, like your favorite double entendre Judas Priest songs when you were writing and you guys were composing, and did that ever come to, into your mind? And I'm not just talking about Turbo Lover or the jawbreaker or, and all these kind of things yeah like what, what like what are your favorites that like yeah well I, I do like the double entendre of jawbreaker and um i've said that the reason i took it down that street that back alley was because i was having an interview with a bit of a wrist merchant journalist and he was winding me up you know so i go oh jawbreaker's about it's like about a big cock you know and he, oh, really and I, you know so I, I took it from there and I've been clarifying it since I've been promoting this book that um, I've never used the band for that kind of titillation or that kind of innuendo or double entendre. It's just it's just a, a funny kind of um, correlation, you know. Um, I love the Jawbreaker song as as a piece of metal. It's absolutely fierce. It's ruthless, yeah, it's, you know. It's, and it's talking about the Jawbreaker is metal. The Jawbreaker is metal, ready to you know to fight and to attack. That's it's it's more it's more of a song of defense and and um, and self belief and sustainability than anything else. But it's funny how the world works, you know. I mean, oh, 2020 and we still like sex cells and this cells and that cells. But um, but no, the only the, the closest reference that we've ever got to that, as you and I've talked about before, Tim, is this song Raw Deal, which again it was just a song about a place that I've still not been to, but. Um, it was just a song that that that, that lyrically, um, it, it took me there, and I, I didn't really think any any more other than, oh, this is a pretty cool song. This is how the the music's making me feel. And when then, and as much as I do now, when I sit with with Glenn especially, and we go through the lyrics together, we agree. I don't push my I don't push my stories and say this is what it's going to be. There's an agreement, and everything that we do in priest, because then much like a relationship. If one person's getting more pushed than the other, then it gets off 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 balance. So, but it, but um, but yeah, it, it's kind of humorous. Eat Me Alive, as you know, was born out of a drunken night out in Ibiza, and we were having a laugh, you know. And I mean, you can't really have a laugh it, to, in, to some extent today because of political incorrectness. Although I do strongly value th that whole issue, um, but. Uh, there you go. It's great. It's I love discussion. I love discussion. I love I love to talk through all of these different um, avenues of ideas and innuendos and possibilities. One thing that I was really fond of reading in your book relates to this collection. Oh yeah, yeah. And just you running yeah. back and forth from school, and yeah. I didn't really clue into the whole metalworks thing until I actually read the book. But right. I, like, actually, this is a really passionate thing. Like, how's your health? Because you sat there and lived and breathed all this shit, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, and you can yeah. still sing like this. You should be well, dead. I mean, yeah, I mean, how about those poor, poor souls that worked in those environments? Yeah. This is before we, before we had a thing called health and safety in the UK. It's the same with, with 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 people working down the coal mines, you know, breathing in all of that stuff and the asbestos workers. I've got a I've got a, a thing at the top of my uh, uh, garden in, in the UK, and uh, it's like a little shed thing. It's got an as, as a pressed asbestos corrugated roof. It's been there forever, and to actually have it removed um, is just like a big deal. It's a big deal. So what I'm saying is that yeah, you know, walking past and breathing those fumes of metal before it was even there musically. It's just remarkable. It's crazy stuff. You can't make it up. 
So this is a great question, given um, what has happened in the last couple of weeks, which is just totally tragic. February 10th, 1978, I find this truly remarkable. Judas Priest released Stained Class. Yeah. And Van Halen released Van Halen 1. Wow. Wow. See, only Tim you know, would know that. Did, did you know that was the same date? I didn't know. I didn't know. Isn't that I shocking? Just, I just said, because um, I've, I've read interviews about how... Yeah. Eddie and, and Alex, they, they, they've obviously been following Judas Priest. So to have their debut come out on the same day as Stained Class and mm. finish the story because it was like... Well, that's just I, beautiful. Yeah, that's just beautiful, isn't it? And I, I tell the story, you know, with the recent passing of Eddie, that the first time I got an earful of Eddie Van Halen was when Dave Cork, who was managing the band at the time, came banging on my door one time and I was still living on the beach so I lost stay. and he goes yeah, I've got this cassette man you've got to come and listen to it right now so we went back to his car and he played me we, we listened to that whole first album of, of Van Halen and I was just I was gobsmacked you know I just didn't know what to think it was so profound everything the, the way David was singing just the whole performance you know from Michael and 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 and, Deb and, and Alex it was just We'd never heard anything like that before, but particularly the guitar playing, it was just, it was shocking. You know, it was, Eddie was a game changer like Hendrix and, you know, all those other greats. So um, yeah, it's nice to reflect and to bring him into the conversation because of what he, what he means to us all still today. Where were you when <coughs> they were headlining Heavy Metal Day at the US Festival? We were getting, we were back at the hotel packing and getting ready to do an overnight flight to Ibiza to start making the next Priest album. We, we, were, we couldn't stick around that day. I didn't see anybody. We flew in and flew out practically. It was a shame. We managed a quick run around backstage to say hello to as many people as we could. But because we had a flight that night, we, um, we didn't get to see the band. It was kind of bittersweet, really. Um, but we did have that one chance way back when we played with them in Costa, uh, at the Santa Monica Civic. Yes. That was special. And um, what a great bunch of guys. And Eddie would come to pre-shows. More often than not, I wouldn't know until afterwards because Glenn would say, Eddie came around and we were just jamming together or, you know, we were talking about music or whatever. So uh, there's a great, um, a great love and respect from both bands to each other. <laughs> Just quickly, as I've um, got a couple more minutes left, um, and we've talked about this before, but I love this story. I was in Camden when Sharon said, Rob, you need to recite these Black Sabbath lyrics on stage for Ozzy because he can't sing. And I was in the crowd and I'm like, oh my God, this is like one of the most memorable heavy metal moments of all time. Yes. Um... I was just as shocked as everybody else was when Bill when Bill went out. Was it? Yeah, Bill went out and read this message from Ozzy. And you know, I was standing on on the side of the stage, shitting myself because I mean, you know, like I didn't know about this three hours prior. She called me up and asked me if I would step in for Ozzy, and of course, that's what mates do. We we look after each other. And then I learned all the set the, as we've talked about before for Brave Words of learned all the set on in the back of the bus as we were going to the show. I did the priest gig, I had a, had a shower, changed my shirt and walked out and did that gig. But um but uh yeah that was that was you you've been around at for some of these magical me metal moments, Tim. So you can you can relate to the feeling that was in the air yeah. when um when that particular moment took place. I couldn't remember it like yesterday, you know. Even though it was a blur, it's a very treasured heavy metal memory for me. So let's talk about Judas Priest 50, which is now turning into 51, sadly. Yes. Enough. <laughs> and, the, I, and I loved your 3D photo today, like a couple hours ago. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah. like, like the tour updates and a studio update. How are things going in the studio? Everything's going well. We had that great writing session at the start of the year. We had some killer tunes. We were so th we were so thrilled and buzzed after the that massive firepower tour, and we were just ready to get back to work, you know, in, in the writing sense. So we have an enormous amount of material. I've got it all in my phone, you know, and we're still piecing it together now. 
Um, Glenn's, Glenn's still at home working his riffs. Uh, he was with Andy Popsalber every now and again and, and formally puts all the riffs and ideas together. Um, Rich is doing the same up in Nashville. Um, I haven't started noodling on my lyrics yet because I'm always, I'm not really a, uh, what's the word? What's the beans with a C? Um, what's the word? Oh God, procrastinate, it begins with a P. Right. Um, I, I like to wait, I like to wait until I've got everything. I like to wait until I've got everything, you know, because that's when I make sense of where my lyrics are gonna take us. So it's coming together, man, it's coming together. We had, we had the stage set built for the 50th, got everything ready, the, the stage set looks phenomenal. We looked at some of the ideas for the songs that we might do and some, you know, again, you, you try and make the best experience as you can, especially for a 50th celebration. But yes, we'll be out. We'll be out for kind of the 51st, but also my 70th um, world tour. And we're all so excited to get back as, as I know you follow me actively on on my social media. And I, I thought I'm gonna put this picture on today. It was taken at the Zenith in Paris. Great show, great, great Metal Maniacs. And um, I thought I'm just gonna put that there and let everybody know how much we miss our Metal Maniacs all around the world. And we can't wait, like all bands, we can't wait to get back on the road again. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rob. And thank you for, Thanks, uh, Tim. for confessing to brave words and all the metalheads around the world. All the best Tell to you. Send me one of those shirts because I can't find them anywhere. I, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna send gonna... you. I'm gonna send you one of these, the Brave Words mask as well. Oh, I'll definitely wear that. Send me that, and then I'll I'll email you later, and then I'll ask you to, where I can get one of those shirts from. I had one of those shirts. It was grey with a green thing on it, and it's vanished, and, and I don't know where it's gone now. Well, it's probably lost under a pile of cat shirts. So I'm gonna. I'm going to reach out to get my peoples to contact your peoples Absolutely. to get me that shirt so I can wear it. Tim, it's lovely to speak with you. Yes. All Stay right. safe. Yep. Stay you metal. Wash all your right. hands. Do all the stuff that the scientists tell us, not the politicians. I'll see you soon, my mate. My mate. Take care. All right. Okay. See you. Bye bye. Okay.